It's the Wolf Den Podcast. Will! Oh. Yeah. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm just great. Everything's good. That's I, good to hear. I feel like I got up early. I got a lot done. But I didn't, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, how are you uh, people in the chat? Eep says, my ears. That wasn't that loud. Yeah, Suck we're fine. You're, yeah. Guys, welcome to the Wolf Den Podcast. We got a lot going on today because there's a Nintendo Direct tomorrow. Yes. And <laughs> we can't talk about it now because it's tomorrow. So we're just going to make it up. Yes. And pretend like we saw it already. And you can all come back next week and talk about how right or wrong we were. Yes. Yeah, so right off the bat, Fogs 2. Yes. They're making it. The first one was so good. They're making a second one. And uh, and it's going to be released exclusively for the GameCube. Yes. <laughs> uh, what else? We're, we're getting a we're getting uh, a, a, a sequel to Mario to Hotel Mario. Yes. Can't believe it. Uh. They have announced the Virtual Boy Collection compatible mm. with the Labo VR kit. There'll be wow. all of the original Virtual Boy games. Uh, and, of course, Red and Black. Uh, and one of the canceled Virtual Boy games that they have yet to reveal. Because they're going to do that in next week's Nintendo Direct. That's right. There's going to be a next week Nintendo Direct. And this this shocked everyone. They released it. You know, remember the 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 zapper for the NES? Yes. They're making yes. one for the Switch, except it's an actual gun, and you can shoot people with it. Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. Anyway, guys, Edward, thanks for the thanks for the host, Rocket Valley, thanks for the raid, also, Booty Doya, thank you for the two months of Prime Triton, that one guy, thanks for the thirteen months. Happy Tuesday. The Nintendo Direct better be good. I know. So, so we should have just moved this podcast, but yeah, <laughs> I like consistency because it helps me get things done. Yeah. So, no. <laughs> If you want to he listen to a podcast that will be talking about uh, um, the Nintendo Direct, well, I'm going to be uh, doing a live reaction tomorrow. Maybe I'll upload that to youtube.com slash Podcast if you're lucky. There you go. Uh, you, so you can see a live reaction there. Um, then also youtube.com slash directly to you. That's AJ's podcast and Parker's podcast. They will talk about it later this week. So I suggest you listen to them. Uh, next week, we'll probably have more things to talk about. Uh, but I want everybody to take your expectations for this Nintendo Direct. It's the first Nintendo Direct in 18 months. Which is but crazy. It's been almost two years since an yeah. actual Nintendo Direct has happened. Everybody take those expectations and just, just bottle them up. And shrink just, it and just push it down. Cause just put it here. This is put, this is my trash. Take just your put it, oh, put it there's here. a diaper in that. <laughs> it's not, it's a it's a wipe. It's empty wipe oh, bag. okay. <laughs> I'm not gonna put a diaper in my I don't know, gun. dude. I don't know what it's like. Dude, if you ever find out, you'll know. Those go in a special garbage. <laughs> I have I I have zero expectations for this Nintendo Direct. They said that they're going to announce stuff. Well, let's look at the tweet. Well, okay, yeah. Uh, my tweet deck doesn't. Uh, my tweet deck. I mean, my stream deck doesn't work again because everything sucks. Right. Yeah. So um, Nintendo of America says to uh, tune in Wednesday at two mm -hmm. p.m. Pacific for a Nintendo Direct live stream featuring roughly fifty minutes. That's a lot of minutes of information yeah. focused on available games like Super Smash Brothers Ultimate and games coming to Nintendo Switch in the first half of twenty twenty one. So that's there's a. I mean, they could be lying, but <laughs> uh, we're, I, I'm assuming we're going to hear about a new Smash Fighter, which is great, which is high. Yeah, that's good. But like, that's an expectation of mine. That's going to be good. You know, mm -hmm. like like. Like I, I have high high hopes for a new Smash Fighter. Games coming out in the first half of 2021, zero expectations. Yeah. All last year we got nothing but 
but crap. <laughs> Like the not, well, not, not, the games were in bed, but the announcements we were getting were very disappointing. So, I, I Nintendo has dropped the ball on some directs, and that's why it's taken so long for them to make a direct because they have a lot to live up to. And the longer they wait, the higher everybody's expectations. So, this this could be a big fat freaking flop, or they I could also be making too, a direct like, because they know that it's gonna be good. I don't know. Yeah. The, Nintendo doesn't really like put out their their biggest guns in the first half of the year, you know. Like I think Breath of the Wild was the exception because that was launching with the Switch itself. But they usually save like their Mario's, their Zelda's, typically uh, for the later half of the year, closer to around Christmas time. Um, and they'll sprinkle out like you know their B level games throughout the year, whereas like their their triple a games are like towards the second half but uh, they could also be lying they could just they could yeah give us a tease or something for the l- later half of the year or, or, or something mm-hmm. um yeah there i mean although i don't know because nintendo like is very specific with their directs because they know people get get their expectations way high mm-hmm. so they always have to like say this is a specific direct focused solely on this <laughs> Yeah, and that doesn't work for yeah. people. Like, like th- they say that, well, and people still are upset that that's all that they talk about. Yeah. Uh, there's so I've been saying that there's something going on with Nintendo that they that's been holding them back from releasing stuff. Um, I don't think we're getting a hardware release in the first half of the year, but there's potential that we could hear about something, and then it opens the floodgates for a bunch of releases. So, right. um. So I'm making, I'm writing a video tonight on something completely irrelevant. And then tomorrow I might switch gears and make a whole different type of video. So right, who knows what's going to happen. But I know we still don't know anything about Bayonetta 3, Metroid Prime 4, Breath of the Wild 2, Shovel Knight Dig, Hollow Knight Silk Song, mm. Azure Striker Gunvolt 3, Yokai Watch 4, Dragon Quest Heroes 1 and 2. Those are all from my video on 2021 games, which is going right. to be irrelevant now. Also, we just got Bowser's Fury and Super Mario 3D World. Um, could we see some more Mario now that this yeah. is finally out? Are there it, any games left that haven't been ported from the Wii U yet? <laughs> that's a good. That's a good question. Yeah, because uh, I mean. That's all they do is port games for the Wii U. I don't yeah. think so. I mean, Splatoon one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we need Splatoon one. Uh, in Nintendo fandom, list of Wii U games ported to the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> What's what has not been ported to the Nintendo Switch though? I mean, at this point, it probably would be easier to list those games. <laughs> w- Wind Waker HD. Is one that a lot of people want. And, and uh, what's what you call it? Twilight Princess. We should be hearing a lot about Zelda because it's it's Zelda's year. Yeah, I'd be surprised if we don't. I don't want to keep speculating on this because by the time everybody listens to this, it's gonna we're it's we're gonna be wrong already. <laughs> yeah. Um. So anyway, just keep your expectations at a bare minimum. Uh, and if you're listening to this and, and the direct is out already, uh, go to youtube.com slash Wolf Den podcast. There might be a long form reaction uh, video. And I might do one on Wolf Den clips. Who knows? Uh, I got a lot to do tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to suck. Nine. There are nine games not yet ported. Like Nintendo published games? Yeah. Like what? What is there? Any big uh, one? Uh, page is loading. Hold on. Uh, Star Fox Zero. All right, get that out of here. It's not happening. <laughs> uh, Fatal Frame. Uh, Breath of the not Breath of the Wild. Yeah, Fatal Frame, Maiden of Blackwater, Legend of Zelda, Wind Waker, We Fit You, Art Academy. Uh, Nintendo Land, Game and Wario, Twilight Princess HD, and Xenoblade Chronicles X. 
Xenoprey Chronicles wasn't? I don't know, man. Like, there are a lot of Xenoblade games, and they're uh, they're all confusing. XX is a different game. Yeah. So Xenoblade Chronicles and Chronicles 2 have been ported. Chronicles X has not yeah. been ported. Okay. Anyway. Uh, let's, let's, let's plow ahead to other things that have happened so far in the last yes. week that, uh, is not related to the Nintendo Direct at all. Like, for example, this thing that I had no idea about until you put it in here. D is this, <laughs> do we learn about this today? Uh, no, this happened a few days ago. Nintendo and Switch I'm still, concierge. still not sure what the hell it is. Yeah. Maybe I could do this. Oh, uh, Nint Nintendo Switch Concierge is a new, no-cost pilot program for new Nintendo Switch system owners. Participants in a virtual one-on-one -on -one meeting participate in a virtual one-on-one -on -one meeting with a Nintendo representative to ask questions, get answers, and learn about everything your Nintendo Switch system has to offer. Uh, how it works. Uh, step one, pick your topic. This session is all about you. So choose the most relevant topic to talk about. We'll try to answer any questions you might have as well, time permitting. Two, choose your appointment. Pick a date and a time that works for you. Three, confirm your spot. Check your inbox for a confirmation email from Nintendo Switch Concierge at noa.nintendo.com. Be sure to check your spam folder too. And four, connect. Chat with a Nintendo representative via a video call. Oh, I didn't even know it was a video call. I am doing this. <laughs> I am so doing this. Uh, please note there is limited session availability. Participation is on a first-come, first-served basis. The offer to participate is non-transferable and is only open to those that have recently purchased a Nintendo Switch system, which you did. Um, Baby! Participation is limited to one session per person. You must be at least 18 years old and live in the United States to I'm all use of those the things. Uh, by participating in the system, you agree that Nintendo may collect video images of you, your voice, and your surroundings in order to interact with you, answer your questions, and enable Nintendo to provide you with the requested service. I am, I mean, I'm going to be recording you too, buddy. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, and these are some of the topics Nintendo Switch 101, games getting started, games what to play next, security and privacy, uh, Nintendo account and customization. Um, you could uh, select the time, edge details, and go. I want to do, I guess, I, I mean, do you only get to pick one? Game. It's set. Duration. What to play next? 30 minutes. Share and discuss recommendations on games to play next on based on who is playing, play styles, favorite game systems, and accessories owned. I'm going to do that. So it said, they says uh, pick a top, pick the most relevant topic you want to talk about, um, but we'll try to answer other questions you may have time permitting. So uh, if you have another question you want to ask them during that 30 minutes, and you have the time, go for it. <laughs> Switch 101, overview of the Nintendo Switch system, including play modes, setup process, purchasing and playing games, including any general questions you may have. What would make for the best video? Cause like, you know what we should do? We should schedule it for the time of the podcast. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Be like, hey, you're live. Uh, walk us through the Nintendo Switch. Should you I know, have- You know this- What? I was gonna say, like this. This is definitely one of those situations where they can record you, but you're not allowed to record them. Why not? <laughs> only in New York, only one party needs to be known that 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 they're being recorded, right? True, but then you're broadcasting it. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, I'm not. Listen, this is going in a YouTube video. <laughs> maybe I mean, maybe that can be one of the questions you ask them. I'm just, hey, well, I would probably you know say, who I am. I would probably say, "Hey, I'm recording this for a video." Yeah. Um. I mean, they're recording me. Why wouldn't it be right? Why wouldn't Why wouldn't it be okay? 
Oh, the stream crashed already. Oh, I know. Uh, Fantastic. Um, so, I mean, Switch 101 would be good if I, like, pretend like I don't know what I'm doing, but my Switch is already right. set up, so I should maybe do... Uh, I kind of want to do what to play next. And the, the yeah. questions, they'll ask me, like, what accessories I have and stuff. And I'll just I'll just name every single thing that I have. Yeah. I'm fixing the stream. Okay. Why isn't it telling me? Oh, there it is. All right, we're back. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting and kind of weird that they would launch a service like this. You know, it's it's very personal. Like it's very one one on one type deal. Like you don't really expect something like this from a big tech company, to, uh, especially like a video game company. They usually just like here you go, just consult our website if, for something else. Yeah, yeah. No, this is uh, this is very interesting. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm signing up right now. There is no availability on this date. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. It kind of reminds me of like um, the Nintendo Players Hotline from like the 80s where you would call the 900 number and they would help you like get through certain parts of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but A, this is free. And B, this is less like a game guide and more about like just being a Switch owner. <laughs> All right, here we go. Next oh Wednesday at... Yeah, at 4 p.m. I think. I think I'm going to do it. Um, as your details. All right, we're gonna we're gonna hide my screen now for that. Yeah. Uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, what is the cost to participate in this program? Uh, there is no cost. It's completely free. Is there any obligation to purchase to participate in this program? The program is a new initiative for new Nintendo Switch owners where you can get your questions answered. There is no additional obligation to purchase anything in order to participate in this program. Oh, wait. I was accidentally doing tomorrow. <laughs> I thought it was next week. Um, shoot. I'll do, I'll do Saturday. Uh, can I invite a friend or family member to join the session with me? The program offers a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a Nintendo representative. You may invite others to join the session with you from the same device. So if you want to invite your roommate on with you, that is allowed. Can I invite... I mean, listen, they're on the same device. Yeah. All, all the people watching are on the same device. Uh, oh, so here's interesting. What are the dates and times available for this session? The program runs throughout January and February, and session dates and times vary based on demand and our Nintendo representative schedules. So it only lists January and February. It doesn't say anything about March or beyond that. But you said this was just announced like two days ago. Yeah, this was like recently announced. So why February? Well, why? why yeah, why not extend it? beyond that who do you think will play your nintendo switch system the most myself or an, myself slash another adult <laughs> if you have children how old are they no what is your gender optional uh how likely are you it auto fills male i don't appreciate that how likely <laughs> are you to recommend nintendo switch systems or games to friends family or colleagues <laughs> 10 <laughs> <laughs> i am very likely to recommend things to other people Book it now, baby. This Saturday, 4 yeah, this p.m. Was a, this I'll was see you. On, this service was announced on Thursday last week. That's weird. That's weird. Yeah. All right. All right. So I'm just going through the FAQ right now. That they, they do mention that it is a pilot program. So this is real. This is really just like a test. I have. I. I already. I'm meeting with a guy named Christian. On Saturday. All right, it's happening. Uh, two more, two more from the FAQs. Will my session be recorded? No, you may not initiate recording of the session, and the session will not be recorded by Nintendo. 
You may not initiate the recording. You may not initiate recording of the session, and the session will not be recorded by Nintendo. Where is this? Where is FAQ. this? FAQ. The app. Scroll down. Uh, recording, recording. Fucking stupid ass piece of shit, Nintendo. You may not initiate recording of the session, and the session will not be recorded. Come on, be a bro. I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna ask. Right in the beginning, I'm gonna say, yeah. "Yeah, I'm gonna record this." Is that okay? And if they say no, then I'll just be. Then I'll say, "Oh, this I'll go f myself." Yeah, um, you should still do it though for the journalism. Uh, do I need oh, you to know download? What? That's any- true. If if they don't record it, I will just report back next week with what with my findings. Yeah. Uh, do I need to download any software programs to join the session? The session will be hosted on Microsoft Teams. If joining from a mobile device, you will need to download the Microsoft Teams app to join the session. So I think they'll just, if you join on your computer, they'll probably just send you a link to like Mm -hmm. a browser-based version of Teams. Um, Unless you want to do it on your phone, then you'll need to get Teams. I'll do it on my computer. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to do it still. And I'm going to ask if they, if I can record it. And if they say no, then I will just, I will journalism it. Yeah. Just be like, you know who I am. <laughs> and they'll turn this way to their wall of YouTubers not <laughs> allowed to talk Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they'll be like, oh crap, it's Woods. So <laughs> it's just going to be a picture of me with like a big <laughs> X out of it. And that's it. Yeah. Um, all right. Session booked. You'll hear more about it next week, unless it it's possible that they just hang up on me. But we'll yeah. see. Um, who else is confused on Nintendo <coughs> Direct date? It's tomorrow. I was confused initially because I thought they were going to do something today, but that was just my own. It's your own stupidity. dumb brain. Yeah, it's tomorrow, five p.m. Eastern. 2 p.m. Mm-hmm. Pacific. Um, also, it's not a legal thing for me. I, I'm legally allowed to record it. They just don't want me to record it. What are they going to do? Right. Sue me? It's, uh, it's, I'm within my legal right. I mean, they, they could they're sue me Nintendo. for defamation, though, if I put the video out. They, they sue. They've sued for less. They could just straight up say, like, uh, oh, they used our logo. Take the video down. All right, well, anyway, uh, we got some notifications here. I'm very behind. We have a lot of notifications. Yeah. Uh, we got... N- Nucker with the seven months. Nintendo's big announcement will be adding Netflix. Yeah, for 50 minutes, they're going to talk about adding yeah. Netflix. Kind of good gamer. Thank you for the Prime sub. Pondy, thank you for the two months. I have low expectations for this direct, but I'm excited f- and prepared for disappointment either way. Uh, good. As you should. You should be. always be prepared for disappointment. Yes, then you will never be disappointed. Yes. Um, Picky Gamer, thanks for the six months. Breath of the Wild 2 trailer, let's go. Now that is the complete opposite. You lower those expectations. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Pondy, thanks for the bit. MK Loomis, thank you for the six months. And T Compy, thank you for the hundo bits. <laughs> I forgot to change uh, your Twitter handle, Will. Okay. <laughs> it says Kevin Kenson. I, I will gladly pretend to be him. You should have should have told me I would have gotten one of my beanies. Yeah. There you go. Fixed. All right. All right, next news. Uh, this I just saw two seconds ago. Actually, no, I didn't. I've been seeing people have been putting this story on Twitter for like the past three days. Um, oh no, this is a different story. Reggie yeah. said some shit, and people have been posting about it for the past couple days. But this is different. Uh, this I just saw today. Uh, this is from VGC Video Game Chronicles. Uh, former Nintendo of America boss says E3 2021 plans, quote, don't sound that compelling. Gee, you think? 
Reggie fils believes the show needs to find a way to get the biggest new games in players' hands. Uh, with several major publishers, including EA, Sony, and Activision, having abandoned the E3 show floor in recent years, the ESA was already facing significant pressure to reinvent the annual trade show prior to the cancellation of E3 2020 due to the coronavirus pandemic. And when last year's convention fell through, other leading publishers, including Ubisoft, successfully launching successfully launched their own digital events to showcase products that would eventually that would previously have been released at E3. In early February, VGC revealed that the ESA is pushing forward with plans for a digital E3 this summer, but that it still requires the backing of major games companies. According to E3 2021 pitch documents sent to games publishers, the ESA's uh, proposed event would include three days of live streamed coverage from June 15th to 17th. The ESA's intention is to hold multiple two-hour keynote sessions, an awards show, a June 14th preview night, and other smaller streams from game publishers, influencers, and media partners. The broadcast event would be supplementary by supplemented by media previews the week before, as well as demos released on consumer platforms. Uh, it's this final proposal, getting new games into players' hands, that the ESA must figure out how to do if E3 is going to maintain relevant, Fizeme told Gamertag Radio. If it fails to do so, the industry veteran believes someone else will do it, and E3 will fall by the wayside. Someone else, like, for example, gee, I don't know, uh, Summer Games Fest? Yeah. <laughs> He says, I think that E3 is as an event and a moment in time uh, where we where new content is shared and celebrated. I think that is truly magical for the global games business, fils said. However, fils said he saw reports about E3 returning digitally in 2021 and wasn't enthused. He said, quote, I have to say that what I read doesn't sound all that compelling, which he feels embracing a while he feels embracing a digital format is the right way forward for E3, fils believes finding a way to offer consumers hands-on opportunities with the biggest ge- upcoming games is the key to success. Quote, if I were king for a day, oh, I wish you would be, I'll yeah. tell you how I would do that, he said. I do th- think doing this digitally is absolutely right and the reason for that is there are more than 60,000 people who would typically attend an E3. There are millions more interested in finding out what's going on and executing an event digitally is the way to bring that to life so that's the right track. Having said that, I think that the platform holders need to find a way digitally to enable their fans their players to experience the content because that's the key for e3 right the ability to be playing the last of us part three for the first time or to play the next breath of the wild game for the first time or to play the next great game coming from the new amalgamation of the all the xbox studios to play for the first time is what's magical and the platform holders need to figure out how to deliver that experience to their fans during an E3 like digital experience I think that would be huge uh I think I think we're good with the rest of the article okay um basically he's saying it's not gonna work out which is what we were saying yeah uh yeah last week we talked about how E3 is going all digital um and again i'm i'm being yelled at for uh i was shitting on e3 and i was being yelled at for uh being very selfish in my in my opinion on e3 because uh for consumers e3 is great but i don't really think yeah. it is it, it in concept in concept it is this idea of that there's, there's one week in the summer where game studios get together and they announce all the games that you're going to be playing in the future, hopefully in the same year, but usually in the next two or three years. Um, but in practice, there are probably better ways to do it. Mm-hmm. Like if, let's say, game publishers, instead of all doing it at the same time, they do it like 
one like Bethesda gets one week, EA gets another week, Activision gets another week. This way, like it's spaced out and everybody gets time. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you said, like you know, Reggie was saying, have demos be available to more people um because most of the time the demos are only available on the show floor and the consumers only have the word of the people who played the games um and it's it'd be a much better experience if they could play the game for themselves and see whether or not uh they would enjoy it, it it's it's uh i'm so I, I said last week also that, yes, it is really great uh, that everything gets announced in one week. Like, that was the best part of E3, was that everything yes. got announced at the same time. And it was like a big, it was like a big deal. It was like, it was like a holiday. Yeah. Um, but E3 is just like a, like an orgy for, for media people, you know? Yeah. It's like the all the big game companies get all the media people together and they go, hey, let me just, you know, let, let me just, you know toot your horn for a little bit so you'll write nice things about me they, yeah these these it, it would be much better for these companies to just release demos for everybody so that everybody mm-hmm. can get to play their games and we kind of saw that a little bit last year not many big companies were doing it but a lot of smaller companies were releasing which is straight up releasing demos for everybody to play yeah big companies are afraid to do that they want uh media people with credentials to play the game so they can toot their horns while they're there so they can jerk them off yeah. while they're playing the game and be like hey you like this right here's some free stuff write good things about me yeah and they can like curate the experience so that then those people can write about it and then tell everybody else how great it is yeah it if, would be if they much really... better if they could just let you people play it and figure it out for yourself if if they released a demo of like their their big game and it's noticeably bad, mm-hmm. um, and people realize that ahead of time, then they're not gonna blindly buy the game for sixty dollars or whatnot when it gets released. Balan it's Wonderland. Much more than... <laughs> what? Balan Wonderworld. Yes, uh, it'd be much more advantageous to them to have the the game journalists. Uh, sites um, who are a bit more buddy buddy with with the industry to write nicer re- uh, previews that always end with well the game looks a little rough but there's still time to polish it for its Nintendo November release and then November comes and the game's crap um, but they embargo the reviews for a day uh, so you buy it on launch day without reading reviews because you can't um, and then you find out the game is crap. <laughs> It's it's a it's a weird dis like you guys get the weird distilled version of of the annou- of the E three announcements. You don't get like yeah. the raw goodness that you would get if you could just play the demo yourself. But then even that is still like a vertical slice of the game that they just yeah, want you. The to The demos play. are very curated. Yeah. So like they they are purposely making sure you play either the best parts or something specifically designed to represent the best parts. Mm-hmm. never forget aliens colonial marines demo because that was specifically curated to look sound and play fantastic and then when the game came out it didn't look sound or play anything like the e3 demo uh, imagine so there was a demo for cyberpunk that they let very few media people play behind closed doors on their own yeah. machines they had to have people come to them and play it um those so imagine what it would be and those people wrote great things about that demo they said that demo was awesome now imagine what it would have been like if they released that demo to the public and then the public could tear it apart reverse engineer it and figure out how broken the game is yeah things would have been a lot different and that's why they don't do that because they don't want that to happen but then you have things like uh, this is completely different, but uh, the Sonic movie. Me and Will saw the Sonic movie before, you know, like a week before it was out or something. Yeah, we went to a press screening. Yeah, and uh, we liked it, but we were like, no one's gonna like this movie. 
<laughs> yeah. We were like, this is a good, like, we like, this, we yeah, liked it because we, we're Sonic fans. This is not a good movie. Yeah. Like, we recognize that, you know, in terms of the cinematic experience, you can, you can get a better kids movie by just throwing a rock hmm. anywhere. Um, but in terms of a movie about Sonic the Hedgehog, who it, it could very well have been the biggest dumpster fire in existence and it, it, it was merely j- just a, a tiny fart <laughs> you know it was but, not but, it was not that bad it but everybody loved the movie yes everybody really liked it and i was not expecting that so yeah uh what i'm trying to say is it's better if you guys get to experience these things for yourself instead of hearing yes. it distilled through media people but mm-hmm. it's better for the companies to distill it through the media people because uh because they, you know, they they jerk them off. Yeah. <sighs> and to be fair, like the media people, like the games journalism, like they serve a purpose. For the most part, they do a good job. For for the most part, they're getting better at recognizing BS and calling mm-hmm. it out. But they're still they still have to work that balance of like placating the EAs and the Activisions and whatnot because they need them to get access to these games early, to get um, review copies, to be able to preview the game, to tell the audiences uh, when they're coming out. So they still have to have this overly friendly relationship with them, even though they're trying to tell you what's actually going on i mean the games journalists are supposed to be the ones who like know games really well they know like okay this is still being worked on so this has really good potential yeah. but you know uh i think it's gonna be really good if they fix this or or you know this one area yeah. was a little weird but they said they're gonna fix that so this game's gonna be good but we've seen time and time again that they're just uh, oftentimes wrong and yeah. so are we so i was talking about how great mass effect andromeda was <laughs> Um. So uh, the point is, it would be great if they would just give demos to people uh, during E3 time instead of having an E3 at all. I think E3 should yeah. just be evaporated completely. I don't think we need it at all. Um, I'm not. I'm not against the concept of it. Like one week where you know the games industry just announces what they're going to be re- releasing for the year. But I feel like the way E3 does it isn't working anymore, and there needs to be a better version of that. And I think making it go online only and releasing demos to the public is a big is a big step forward. Yeah, it, it's. It, uh, I mean, the only problem is there needs to be somebody who who orchestrates it who puts it all together right and nobody wants to work with the esa yeah because they're garbage so uh it's, it just sounds like a perfect opportunity for summer games fest to, to be a lot better this year yeah um anyway uh so that's that i hope i hope uh the esa uh really fails <laughs> <laughs> um Hey, did you know Super Mario 3D World sold a lot? I didn't know it sold that much, but yeah. It sold a lot according to the UK charts. So this is only from the UK. Uh, it sold 190% more than the Wii U version. That is a lot. <laughs> Fastest selling re-release no, release. Fastest selling release yet in 2021. Wow. So is it 190% more than the Wii U version in total or in just the f- first few days? I think it's in... Well, let's read the article, I think it's Will. total, yeah. We never doubted... Su- this is from uh, Nintendo Life. We never doubted mm. Super Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury would be successful. Recently awaiting it awarding it 10 out of 10 stars 3d world was the last switch port we'd been waiting on from the super mario 35th anniversary celebrations so far it's doing significantly better than the wii u edition selling 190 percent more box copies at launch in the uk and dethroning animal crossing new horizons from the number one spot 
It said at launch. So I don't know what that means. Well, let's continue reading. Considering the Switch currently has an 80 million strong user base compared to the Wii U's lackluster 6 million when 3D <laughs> World was launched in 2013, that's hardly surprising. Releasing on the same day as the PS4 in Europe probably didn't help matters either. Eventually selling 5.86 million copies in its lifetime, Super Mario 3D World uh, was the Wii U's second best-selling game, beaten only by Mario Kart 8. I did a not great result. A great result. A great result for a Wii U title, but an average one at best for a main Mario entry. 3D World plus Bowser's Fury also marks the third biggest uh, Super Mario launch on Switch so far. These launch sales uh, fell short of surprise of surpassing its 3D companions, Mario Odyssey and 3D All Stars became ahead of 2D entries, Super Mario Maker, and new Super Mario Brothers U Deluxe. Uh, elsewhere on the chart, FIFA 21 uh, went from 8th place to 3rd place. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe dropped from 2nd to 5th. Jesus Christ, why is that game still on the charts? Um, <laughs> Little Nightmares 2 is only is the only other entry, new entry to the chart, sliding into 7th place, while Ring Fit Adventure has dropped f- uh, from 4th to 10th. So it doesn't specifically say how many copies Bowser's Fury sold. Just that it's 190% more than the Wii U version. I yeah, I still I still don't know if it's in total or if it's for the first week. So rounding up to 200, that means that if if it's total, that means that uh Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury sold like 15 million copies. Uh, where's the Wii U number? Eventually, uh, selling second, five, 5.86 million six copies in its lifetime. Yeah. It would be 12 million. It would be less than 12 million. Yeah, if I did that in the first few days, which would uh, be be wild, but uh, I don't. Is that possible for the no, UK not, only? Not, no, that's not. I don't no, think that's possible. absolutely not. Not for a weekend. So yeah, it must know. it must be at launch. Yeah. So whatever whatever uh, New Super Mario uh, not New Super Mario's uh, 3D World 3D World sold at launch. This beat it by almost two hundred percent. I'd also like to note that of the top 10 charts in the UK, we got one, two, three, four, five Switch games. And is Little Nightmares only on Switch? Uh, I don't know. I'll look it up. Uh, that would if little that would mean six out of the 10 games are, are Switch games. I can't believe Animal Crossing's still up there, too. Uh, it's not only on Switch. Okay, so five five out of the ten games are Switch only. Yeah. Jesus Christ. All right. Um, so I played a lot of Bowser's Fury. Uh, I'm a I'm like one stream away from hundred percenting it. Damn. Um, it's it's a it's a quick hundred percent. Um, it's a great game. I like it a lot. Uh, uh it, f- yes. Oh, go ahead. Keep saying what you're saying. So, uh. I mean, 3D World was was not my favorite 3D Mario game. It's still a great game, but it's not. It's not you know. Yeah. It's pretty low on my list of 3D Mario games, but Bowser's Fury is 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 very good. I think I think part of the problem with 3D World is that it has a fixed camera for like, I think the whole game. Um, yeah. Or like you can do like a little bit of rotation with the camera, but not much. Bowser's Fury is just straight up. You could do whatever you want. A free look rotating camera. It's a whole like like world. It's like a it's like a big Odyssey world. It's a little right. disappointing that there's like tiny islands. But uh it's 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 a big open sandbox. You can do whatever the hell you want in it. It's great. I I've been having a great time with it. And it's it's quick, it's easy. Um I just wish that uh they would sell it standalone for like 30 bucks. I think it's a, I think it would be a great standalone uh, purchase. Do you think they sold it bundled? Cause they weren't sure of the concept and they wanted to test it 
Yes. With 3D World. Because that's basically what they did with uh, Cat and Toad. They bundled it with, you know, the original Super Mario. Like, they had levels in the original 3D World. And then they released it on as its own thing. Yeah, that was like a mechanic they put into 3D World to, like, get people, like like put on for captain toad and then people liked it so yeah. much they made their own game uh which is also a great game yeah i don't know so i mean i don't know how they could think that this concept wouldn't work like it's such a good idea it's just mario it's just more the game's already good mario 3d world is already good they just took yeah. that and they made it open they just opened it up like how could that not do well you know uh one thing that always gets brought up is like uh you know every mario game or 3d mario game he needs to have like a companion mechanic of some sort like cappy or flood or whatever in this game yeah. he's got bowser jr who kind of doesn't do anything and you, you could set him to do nothing you could just have him you know fuck off um i set him to do to, to do a little bit of help so he, he just kind of like will like like smack an enemy every once in a while um he's mostly out of the way but you also have plessy who is like your car he's like your vehicle you you get <laughs> yeah. him to to uh to zoom to the different islands that you need to get to and then of course you have the mechanic of bowser furying every couple of minutes which does get annoying so he basically just acts as a weather effect <laughs> yeah he's a weather effect uh he adds more platforms sometimes there's okay. certain shines you can only get when fury is activated which is kind of really okay. annoying because like i'll be in the middle of doing a shine and then uh bowser's will be furious and uh i'll be like oh now i gotta do this other shine while i have him furious i wish so like, is I, I wish after you beat the game it would let you just turn it on or off at will that would be a lot easier right so is the point of Bowser's Fury to eventually fight Bowser? Like you fight him? him multiple times. It's like Ganon. It's okay. like basically exactly like Ganon. Um, you, you you fight him. You fight him multiple times until you get enough shines, and then you could you could defeat him. But okay. just like Ganon, I mean, this is spoilers, but not really. Um, at once you beat him and roll credits, you get thrown back to before you beat him. Uh, okay. Just like when it, you fight Ganon, you fight him, and then you get thrown back to right before you fight him. So there's no, no actually ever beating him. Yeah. Um, that's why I kind of wish like after you beat him, it would give you the option to turn him on or off. Because right, right. uh, I would like to leave him on sometimes to 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 get through all the fury shines. But every time you pick up a shine, he goes away. So if you get the fury shine he'll leave or if you or if you finish the shine you were already working on he'll leave okay it's like that's kind of annoying but mechanically it's a fantastic game it's designed really like beautifully uh, a lot of the shines i've gotten so far are a lot of fun uh i suspect when i get towards the end of my 100 percent run there they will become a lot more annoying because that's usually what happens uh, with mario games how significant how different in terms of because you say like you ke you keep collecting shines whereas in the original 3d worlds you just have to make it to the end of the level mm -hmm. to the flagpole so in that case how different in terms of gameplay is bowser's fury from the main 3d world because i just assumed you know mechanic wise it's the same game just in a more open world so that's what's really interesting mechanically it's exactly the same but okay. It's in a, a world that's similar to an Odyssey world. So the power-ups are 3D world. The way you move around in the world is 3D world. But uh, you collect... The shines are like collecting moons. You go collect Got the it. shine, and then you stay in the world, and you don't move. You could... You could... Mm -hmm. uh, you could you don't get like teleported to like the beginning of the level or anything. You get the shine, and you can me immediately get the next shine from where you're standing. Right. Which is why Plessy comes into play, because uh, you can get a shine and then be like, all right, I got to be on the other side of town. You can hop onto Plessy and take off to the other side of town. And kind of, you can't really like call on him like a horse, but Plessy's usually just always in the water, like right by you. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
I think this is a great little test to show that uh, Mario has a lot of legs on his own and uh, you could do fun stuff like this, like like little worlds uh, or like a big open world Mario game. Like the, there's there's right. legs for that sort of situation. Um, again, I just wish that they would freaking make it $30 and sell a standalone because I didn't, I don't need right. 3D World again. Like I'm cool without having 3D World. Um, well, clearly, a lot of people didn't get to play 3D World. So that is true. I forgot yeah. about that. That almost nobody played 3D World. Um, if you haven't played 3D World, 3D World's great. This is definitely worth sixty dollars. Uh, it's definitely worth sixty dollars uh, if you want to play a little bit of 3D World and all of Bowser's Fury. Um, yeah. Bowser's Fury is just quick. Uh, I, I That's why I hesitate to say that Bowser's Fury is worth $60 on its own. I would have paid $60 for it, but uh, it is a little quick. Our buddy Scootish was the first person to speedrun 100% Bowser's Fury. Really? And he did it in like eight hours, so it wasn't a speedrun at all. <laughs> but because he was the first one to register it. Oh wow! So congratulations to you. Now he's never gonna shut up about it. Uh, this is my first playthrough of 3D World. Didn't have a Wii U for a long time, says Sarge. So this is the perfect game for you. Yeah. Enjoying 3D World with my wife and nephew. Oh, I'll be playing 3D World on Thursday with Dan and AJ. Um, I might give my copy away on Thursday here on Twitch. So, uh, oh, that. So I forgot. I forgot that 3D World is a multiplayer game. Yeah, and it's so online. You, but, so, is Bowser's Fury also multiplayer? Only locally, and it's it's kind of a hmm. chintzy multiplayer. It's like how second player controls Cappy. Oh, the it's second a player bullshit multiplayer. Yeah, the second player controls Bowser Junior. So it's like Tails. It's better. It's it's a little better than Cappy, but it's uh, yeah. it's it's not better than Tails. No, that's the uh, that's like the stupid, you know, you, like you have an annoying younger sibling and you just want to shut them up. Here, do something. It's not real multiplayer, man. I was always Tails. It's true, and that's uh, why you're so angry. <laughs> uh, Rain dude says, "What would you think of if they made a remake of New?" of or new mario sunshine that's so that's what everybody's saying everybody's saying do you think we're gonna get a sunshine 2 or an odyssey 2 uh i don't really think either i think they'll do something creative uh, if anything it would be an odyssey 2 because odyssey a sold really well b is more fresh in people's minds and c that's the nintendo switch super mario so i would not mind a sunshine 2 though like sunshine uh the mechanic like the flood mechanic was really good i i didn't have a problem with the flood mechanic I, all the problems i had with sunshine were the way that the game was designed in it in itself like the game was had just had bad level design um yeah. i mean it's still a good game but compared to all the other mario games it had pretty poor level design um right so a new mario sunshine would be great but so would a new odyssey too i think they'd both be good an odyssey 2 with sunshine inspiration so like you have to use the flood <laughs> see that's in an odyssey style game this is what i'm saying like we don't need the companion mechanic you could just have mario he's fine well, on his own well think about it like this mario galaxy was fine on its own but then galaxy 2 they gave you yoshi mm -hmm. you didn't have to use him all the time but he was there for certain things so odyssey 2 just do that instead of yoshi give him flood well that's what that's that is i'm cool with that have a mechanic yeah. like yoshi like in super mario world he's there sometimes you don't need yeah. him all the time like i don't need cappy on my damn head all the time <laughs> even though it is fun to move around with cappy but yeah. uh still i think mario is just fine on his own uh so that's it if you haven't gotten bowser's fury yet uh it's great i recommend it uh, hard to say if it's worth $60 for Bowser's Fury alone. I would pay it because 
takes a long time to 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you just want to beat it once, uh, it's hard to recommend it for $60. Uh, but it's definitely worth $60 if you want both, if you want to play a little bit of 3D World while you're at it. And yes, there's online multiplayer, and I heard the online is actually really good. Um, I'm dropping frames. Why am I dropping frames? Uh, so yeah, I heard the online is actually good. It, it's up. I I don't think it uses the new online that like Monster Hunter is gonna be using. Right. But uh, it um supposedly it runs really good. But it's also hard to tell. Like, I mean, my Smash Brothers runs really good if I'm playing against other people who also have good internet. Right. Anyway, uh, I don't know what this is. I put this in here. I thought we'd figure it out together. Okay. Uh, the Retrobit Prism HD is another HDMI adapter for the GameCube. Oh, Retrobit. Oh, I've heard of them. Yeah. They, yeah, they make controllers and whatnot. Yeah. HDMI output on the GameCube has been around for a while. Back in 2018, we got the 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 rather rough and ready GC video plug and play. I don't even know what that is. Um. Okay. Which did the job, but came in a rather ugly 3D printed case shortly after there oh, came I've, the... I've the Eon GCHD adapter and not long after its sequel. And in 2019, a budget option arrived in the shape of the Insurrection Carby. All right, well. I've only heard of it as the Carby. That's a bad name. I have never heard of that either. Yeah, I've heard of the Carby, but I, I don't know it as the Insurrection. All of these devices use the same... Uh, GameCube video software and they all have one notable weakness. Updating them to the latest version of GC video requires some degree of disassembly. Enter Retrobit's Prism HD adapter. It's also running GC video and offers the same lovely HD visuals as its rivals but the key difference is that it ha has a USB-C port on the side which means you can update it easily it's also running mm. the latest version of GC Video 3.0e out of the box, which is nice. Oh, and like the Carby, it comes with its own remote so you can access GC Video's UI more easily. The GC HD doesn't offer this. Yeah, it was a bit of a pain in the ass to hook up a remote to the GC HD. Yeah. Uh, like other HDMI adapters, the Prism connects the GameCube's digital AV port. Make sure you have a DOL001 model number GameCube. As Nintendo removed the digital AV port, or just look at the back of your GameCube. If and there's go, two have ports, a digital port? If there's two ports, then you have the right one. <laughs> I think looking at the looking at the number is kind of like a like a, a that, step too far just look at the port does it have the port <laughs> that's how yeah that's helpful if you like you need to look for like internal revisions but this is yeah. an external revision yeah does it have the port or not yeah. um anyway the picture quality is a massive step up from what we've normally used to or we're normally used to unless of course you're lucky enough to own a gamecube component cable making games appear super sharp I'll I'll note now if you don't know the GameCube uh, component cable is like really rare and really expensive, mm -hmm. uh, so nobody has that shit. Making games appear super sharp, G GameCube video also allows you to tinker with various aspects of the picture, including adding scan lines, so you can mess around to get the image you truly desire. Uh, as we noted, with other HD adapters, the picture quality is going to vary depending on your TV. There's no upscaling going on here, which means the Prism HD doesn't reduce any, in, doesn't introduce any lag. So your TV has to do the heavy lifting in this regard. Not all TVs handle 480i or 480p images the same way. The process of upscaling the signal could include could introduce lag or produce a fuzzy picture. So you might want to experiment with a few TV sets if you have the option. Uh, I had a problem with some monitors with 480p. Uh, right. Not all monitors do 480p good. Um, but 
uh, you plug this baby right into a frame meister. That'll upscale it real nice. 1080p baby, get it working on anything. The only other real negative with the Prism HD is that unlike the Eon GCHD, it only plugs into the digital AV port. While the GCHD didn't make any use of the analog port, it plugged into it to provide a much needed stability. The Prism HD, on the other hand, sticks out quite a bit, qu quite a bit far and is easy to knock. Given the HDMI cable plugs into the end of the HD, the Prism HD rather than the side, you'll need a lot of space in your AV unit to house the GameCube with the adapter attached. It really would have made more sense to have the HDMI port on the side. So that that is a big thing. The GCHD plugs into both ports for stability because there have been instances with the with the, the first one that came out, the GC video plug and play, where if that gets jostled or like you hit the GameCube in any way, um, it'll short out the GameCube. Yeah, that happened to Metal Jesus. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can't you can't really touch that at all. Which is, it's okay. a it's a very delicate connection. So it, they, they should have uh, just Eon. They I'm surprised like more companies don't do that. Like Eon has proved it works and like it's needed. But or, or all the other ones just plug it. into the put wings yeah. on it up and down so that when you plug it in, it it can't jostle. You know, like it's yeah. more stable. Uh, that seems that seems like a missed opportunity. Or even better, uh, you could just make it a cable instead of a. I mean, you know, it has to be in there, but have a little like a I th cable that hangs down instead of having a a port. I think the problem is because eight like you technically you need to be licensed by the HDMI coalition to make HDMI products, and I think a lot of these companies aren't. So that's why they don't make them cables. Oh, that's different than a port? Like you... Because it's got I a port in it. Yeah. I think that's different. Yeah. Well, yeah anyway, there's the HDMI licensing administration. <laughs> in terms of price, the Prism HD is around the same price as the Carby, around $80, but is arguably a better option when you consider that you can update it with the minimum... With the minimum of fuss. These are British people talking. And it's worth noting that GC Video got several firmware updates in 2020 alone. While there's still while there's little difference between the available options when it comes to actual picture quality, the Prism HD is definitely worthy of consideration. Although if you already own an adapter like this, there's perhaps less reason to make a purchase. So I was just wondering how much better it is than the GC HD. The GCHD is $150, or it was. Um, it might even be more now, to be honest. Uh, no, uh, $150. Bucks. Oh, wow. Someone's selling what? it for freaking uh, $300. On Amazon, it is new $250. Uh, GameStop, game? it's 150 yeah um well 100 it retails for 150 uh yeah. this prism hd is only uh 80 dollars. yeah so but this is a uk site so is that is that pounds uh hold on i i, I went to the site no it's dollars it's using dollars okay so uh so yeah it's like half the price that's pretty good yeah uh cool so i mean that's what i was hoping for is something that makes this a little more accessible because the gchd is really hard to recommend to people yeah. i mean it's great it's awesome it, it great it does everything you want to do it has settings but you never have to touch them it it is the it's probably the best option uh but something like this is a more accessible option that makes sense yeah this would be easier for people to, to just pick up yeah is the stream okay for everybody it's been it's i'm dropping a lot of frames but it, it seems to be working fine on my other computer i mean on my other monitor so i don't know and i know that we're i mean we're, we're recording this so youtube and podcast services will be fine yes 
Uh, next news. Hot off the presses. Yes, this is exciting. Xbox announces its own $100 Best in Class wireless headset. Uh, why don't you read while I see what's going on here? Okay. Oh, my computer um, going at two frames a second. Uh, priced at $99.99 US dollars or $89.99 British pounds and available for pre order now. The new first party accessory promises to deliver best in class audio and chat performance, outstanding design and comfort, and unique and unique experiences that are tailored for each gamer. The headset supports spatial sound technologies, including uh, Windows Sonic, uh, Dolby Atmos, and DTS Headphone X. Um, it can be used wirelessly across multiple de multiple devices, including Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, and Windows PCs, and can connect to mobile devices via Bluetooth. Using the Xbox Accessories app, on the console and PC, players can customize equalizer settings, bass boost, and auto mute sensitivity, mic monitoring, uh, and the brightness of the mic's mute light. Uh, Microsoft says it plans to evolve the product over time uh, via wireless updates delivered from the Xbox consoles. Well, that's cool. So if, if you're using this on console, it'll just beam the update to the headset. That's nice. Uh, 30 minutes of charging provides about four hours of battery life with three hours of charging when not in use uh, required to reach the full 15 hours of battery life. We spent a lot of time in the audio testing chambers trying to characterize and understand how the headsets reproduce audio in different room environments, says Eric Garcia, project architect and lead. It goes in your, it goes in your living room, game room and dorm room, and we want it to sound the best for all those types of audio and in the same way, the team studied gameplay to ensure great sound, great sounding chat, sensitive a sensitive mic to prevent background noise. Um, and then there are some pictures of it. The, the chat says that we're we're dropping frames randomly, but the audio is perfectly fine. Okay, and some people are saying lower the quality. So if you're on okay. a phone, you're probably fine. But if you're on desktop, lower the quality down to like 480p or something, then it should be okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't want to switch servers again it might fucking cause a whole problem yeah so th this headset was in uh an xbox preview like it was in of like a like one of the like series x like uh like preview videos like on a guy's head right. and then nobody yeah. noticed that it was a brand new xbox headset this that seems to be microsoft's thing yeah like hi, yeah it's so like phil spencer had it at a series s in his office like during uh interviews for the series x apparently todd howard had um the the fertility idol for raiders of the lost ark on his desk uh -oh. um uh before like they announced that bethesda was gonna be making the indiana jones game so and now the same thing with the headset <laughs> This is a cool looking headset. I mean, it looks it is. Uh, it looks a lot like the Sony headsets and stuff. It looks I mean, after looking at the friggin' new Apple headset, yeah. I have a newfound appreciation for all these other headsets. I think <laughs> I think this looks a lot like cleaner and simpler than the Sony but at least the PlayStation 5 headset. The PlayStation 4 headset was like a, a decent like an average looking headset, but th this looks compared to the PlayStation 5 headset, this looks more like a good traditional headset yeah i'm still not a headset guy like i i still like my in-ears uh and i don't like having a big thing weighing down on my head i'm sure they sound great though i i, I just have like a cheap the cheap pdp headset that i plug in i mean i like I really... these these things are great for uh for ease of use like like, like yeah. the sony headset is it just you plug you you pick it up and it just works same thing with this uh, I would imagine that this works like that. Yeah. Uh, but there's all these other things like they talk about, like all the like technical details about the audio and stuff and how it's engineered a certain way for you to hear like all 360 directions and all this stuff. And it's all nonsense. It's still left, yeah. right. And it might do stuff to like reduce noise and stuff, but it's just a freaking headset. Well, is it, is it only stereo? 
I mean, it was the same thing with the Pulse 3D headphones. Like, like they, like it's not surround sound. It's 360 audio, which is not surround sound. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's like technically it's like, it is. Well, no, it's almost surround sound, but it's not. Like, like you can't, you can't hear a sound coming from like in front of you versus behind you. But for whatever reason. Oh. But like that's surround sound to me, right? Surround sound is there's a sound coming from behind me. Well, surround sound is just, you know, you have speakers not only in front of you, but behind you as well. The sound is surrounding you. Right. And 360 audio technically is the same thing. It surrounds no. you. So, so it should be because that's the because it's called 360 audio. Right. But there's no way to tell if a sound is coming from in front of you or behind you. There is a way to tell if a sound is coming from above you or below you for some reason. Right. And that's Dolby that's Dolby Atmos's. Oh. Sound coming from above. Okay. Yeah. Demon Souls allows you to hear sounds from behind. Well, I gotta I gotta play Demon Souls with that thing because I played Astro's Playroom and and Spider Man. And neither <laughs> let me hear things coming from in front of or behind me. So one of the things that this did not this article didn't say, but I saw earlier about uh, this headphone in particular is it can connect to your Xbox and your phone at the same time. That is awesome. So you can be on a call with somebody on your phone while still playing your game and the audio will balance out properly. That is, that's good for discord. Yes. That's good for the Nintendo switch online app. I mean, like <laughs> there, there's some Nintendo's, so headsets that will like yeah. uh the steel series uh one people really like that headset because you could connect to your phone and use discord yeah. and stuff uh i tried to do that when i went home to play call of duty but uh i couldn't find that headset for some reason um it's you kind of need a bit of an elaborate setup if you want to have like discord and game audio but this makes yeah. it so you don't need an elaborate uh setup you just need a headset yeah Um, uh, I also like how it just works with your Xbox because something that everybody forgets about the PlayStation versions is that you need a dongle. Yes, that is super annoying with the with the with the Pulse 3D headset. And like, I, like, there's I no don't reason for that nonsense. I don't understand why in 2020 you need a dongle for a wireless headphone. So so. So, I mean, I would guess their excuse would be the speed and, and the latency and stuff. But Microsoft has its own proprietary wireless technology. So maybe it's yeah. using that. It's not using maybe. Bluetooth, is it? Do we, do well, we know? It, would, it would need to use Bluetooth to connect to the phone. Yeah, it says can connect to mobile devices via, via Bluetooth. So, well, I think... No, I think it might be Bluetooth because I think you can can I think you can connect Bluetooth headphones to your Xbox, but you can't connect Bluetooth headphones to your PlayStation. So, so here's here's the thing. So you're correct, but I think that it connects to your phone via Bluetooth, but it allows you to do both at the same time because one is Bluetooth and one is a different wireless technology. Right. Um, it just says wirelessly across devices. Yeah, uh, on on the actual news uh, Xbox news page for it, it says the headset also connects to mobile devices via Bluetooth for on the go music or to chat to your console via Xbox wireless technology, just like the Xbox wireless controller. That makes sense, and that explains yeah. why you don't need a dongle because that their wireless yeah. technology is fast enough as it is. You can also simultaneously pair the headset to your phone and Xbox. That means you can chat with a friend, or as the engineering team recalls doing, dial into a conference call on your phone and play on your console at the same time. That's that's great. Yeah, I don't see any mention of a 360 audio, but uh, I'm sure it's probably exactly the same. <laughs> I mean, if it has, it has Dolby if Atmos. it has Dolby Atmos, and okay, so according to the the news site, headphone supports industry leading spatial sound technologies, including Windows Sonic, 
Dolby Atmos and DTS headphone X for realism and audio precision that fully surrounds you. All right. So this sounds to me, this sounds like, uh, this sounds like Sony getting real. Remember when they were like making a big deal about how the, um, like, like their, uh, they're 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 gonna have solid state drives. It's gonna talk to the to the to the CPU in like different ways yeah. and make it like so much better. And Xbox is like, yeah, we're doing that too. You didn't have to spend an hour yeah. talking about it. We're gonna do the same thing. <laughs> this, that's what this sounds like. It sounds like they're making a Sony's making a big deal about three sixty audio and Xbox. Yeah, is like, yeah, we got we got the same thing. Yeah, we got the same thing. <laughs> uh, now here we go. Specifications. Uh, do, 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 do. Saladite says it tries to simulate them, but it doesn't do that well. It's usually called virtual surround sound, where they try to enlarge the sound stage while still only having two speakers, so it's not as good. Yeah, yeah it's, to, virtual, I, it's virtual surround sound. There used to be called. those like Turtle Beach headsets. I don't think I've ever actually used a surround sound Turtle Beach headset, but there were the ones that were like, so it said like 7.1, and you're supposed to be yeah. able to hear things in front of you and behind you. And I'd imagine that would help with certain games i've seen i've seen like true 5.1 surround sound headphones and what they do is they have i'll have to take this off for a second yeah they have little speakers they'll have like they'll actually put like five speakers in the cup of the headphone in each headphone and like we'll have to program it so that the sounds come out of the proper speaker yeah yeah uh, that's what I like. I'm wondering why we don't have that for gaming. Like, what's up? Yeah, podcast is just cheaper to do virtual. Yeah, but it's, that's that like that doesn't solve the problem of like I want to no. know where the footsteps are coming from when I, when they're coming <laughs> to get me. Um, Sony have the best headset on the market, Bob. So I still think the Pulse 3D will sound better than the Xbox ones. Uh. Why do you think it's the best headset on the market? Because they said it was. <laughs> this one's not out yet. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta try them both before you could, you know, yeah. say which one's better. Uh, this one will be available uh, March sixteenth, but you can pre-order it now. And KJ says it will cost too much. Uh, it will cost the same price as the Pulse three D headset. It it costs a hundred dollars American. Which is kind of, I mean, I mean, I don't need a headset. So it's a lot for me because I don't need a headset. But if you need a headset, may, uh, that's not a bad price. Again, I think the Pulse headset and, and this looks great. I think they're both great. I'm not saying one's better you, over the other. Did you get I, the Pulse headset? No, but I tried, uh, I, I tried, I tried one out. I, somebody, yeah. E gave me his to try out while I was doing the PlayStation video. Um, and uh and yeah i was like uh it's not worth a hundred dollars for me but i also have a setup that is allows me to wear headphones like whatever headphones right. i want i understand that like some people want to play at their li in their living room and they want to make sure that other people can't hear it so something like a headset like this would actually be really good for them because it's very easy to use yeah. with the console the <sighs> pulse headset is also a hundred dollars Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. They're both the same price. It's both the same price. Uh, does the Xbox support 3.5 millimeter in in the audio uh, jacks? Yeah, in the uh, in the in the controller. No, the the headset. Oh, does the new headset they just announced support that? That would be really cool, I don't... but I doubt it. I don't think it does. The the Pulse headset does. Oh, it does? Oh, yes. plus one of the Pulse headset. That According to Sony's website, that's they say it's for PlayStation VR. Ah, but the fact But the fact that they have it. So, so, so that's, so the only positive we're seeing so far with the Xbox, well, there's two positives with the Xbox controller. One, it works with Bluetooth simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I definitely got that word right. And, um, and it doesn't require a dongle. Yes. However, the Pulse 3D 
has it allows you to use a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack and i think that that works when the thing's dead so you might be able to just plug it in if you don't want to charge yeah. it um i mean I, I don't think that means yeah you're i mean i don't think you'll get the full 3d no. effect no you won't yeah and it says built-in headset controls not supported on psvr or mobile devices so if you plug it in using 3.5 millimeter, you're not going to get the be able to use the controls on it, right? So, but it's still an option. Uh, all right. Hey, T Compy, thanks for the hundred bits again. I appreciate you. Uh, Dual Sense Drift is a thing. Yes. So this new story went live right when you guys went live last week. <laughs> oh. Like immediately when you hit uh launch like when you hit go live, this new story broke. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh few things about the PlayStation 5 are better than the dual sense controller. It feels terrific to hold. Somehow it uh just as solid as it is light. The haptics are truly dynamic. At least for gamers that off for games that offer the support, um, it's beautiful. But even the mighty Dual Sense uh, reportedly isn't immune to the Achilles heel of modern game controllers drift. When you think of controller drift, your mind probably drifts to Nintendo. Uh, pretty much immediately after the Hyper Console launch in 2017, unlucky players came to know the dreaded term Joy-Con drift. In other words, the thumbsticks would habitually malfunction, sending the console false inputs even when players weren't touching them in 2019 nintendo acknowledged the issue in a comment to kotaku and announced a new policy that both offered afflicted owners free repairs and granted refunds for prior repairs last year nintendo's president formally apologized for the whole debacle but didn't say a word about that class action lawsuit now ps5 owners are reporting a similar issue with the dual sense since the ps5 was released in november players have taken to social media to share stories about dual sense drift uh one user reported the issue 10 days after receiving their playstation 5 stating they tried every possible fix power cycling the console turning bluetooth on and off resetting the controller and finally uh charging charging it fully overnight to no avail another uploaded a video to reddit that appears to show some serious uh controller drift in the 15 second clip, you can clearly see the player's fingers off the thumbstick while playing Destiny 2, and yet the player's gun, a, sna a snazzy sidearm that bears strong resemblance. So, okay. The gun drifted across the screen uh, of its own accord. Uh, yes, Beyond Light's Euphoria boasts some stunning vistas, but they're better enjoyed when you're actually at the controls. Uh, at the moment, your options for fixing a busted dual sense are slim. You could go through Sony's PlayStation support page, which has a dedicated portal for issues with PS5 hardware, including the DualSense controller. Just keep in mind that PlayStation support team is swamped at the moment, fielding questions. Sorry, uh, they're swamped at the moment, fielding requests about the PS5, which is still nigh impossible to find. When I tried hitting up the support page, I was told to reach out to a customer service agent via the contact page for PlayStation support. In a conversation over instant messages, the agent told me to call 1-800-345-7669 and press 1 for PS5. So I guess that's the direct hotline for Sony support. I did so and then listened to, no joke, a dozen different pre-recorded messages informing me that PlayStation support is not the place to inquire about finding a PS5. Uh, I was then <laughs> kicked over to hold. Uh, on the plus side, it was soundtracked by the Last of Us theme. Oh, that's on, nice. the not on the not plus side, I had to listen to it for 17 minutes. <laughs> As ever, PlayStation support remains a busy... Uh, Byzantine maids of conflicted emotions. Once I eventually made it through to a person, I was told the dual sense drift is is covered under warranty. You will you will, however, have to pay for shipping your controller to a Sony repair center, a cost that varies based on a number of factors, including location and total weight of your package. But Sony apparently covers the return shipping. 
no recoup on whatever you pay for shipping the first label. Theoretically, the available the ability to tweak a controller's dead zone on a system level should offer a salve, at least in a band-aid on a bullet wound sort of way. The latest dual sense update, uh 0210, did not add such support. Neither did the last PS5 firmware update. It's unclear if future PS5 updates will add such support. Uh Kotaku reached out to Sony for a comment, but at press time did not hear back. What is this? What is what? Yes, there's an article on here that's just the picture is uh suggestive. Oh, uh that's a Jezebel article oh. about yeah. That makes I, sense. I feel like that's all you need to know. That's I'm I'm I understand now. It's the article's yeah. name is Do the Patriarchy to Me. It's something of I put I, I clicked on I actually clicked on it and I read a little bit more. It's something about like navigating sex in a man's world or whatever i didn't get very far (laughs) i understand do we know how widespread this uh patriarchy is no i mean do we know how widespread this uh (laughs) this dual sense drift is um not at the moment but it seems to be big enough that people are noticing it like there are no hard numbers, but there are, but there are several, there are now several cases of it happening. Okay. Again, the the PS five only came out in November, so I, I'm I'm assuming we're going to hear more and more about this as the year goes on. Because when Joy-Con drift happened, it was only like a handful of people. Then it started to affect everybody. It affected me. So. So, um. You can't tweak the dead zones on a on a switch controller, right? Like you you can you could look at them, but I don't think you could actually tweak them. No, I don't think you can fix it on the switch itself. Um, they did release updates that tweaked the the, the dead zones on switch controllers. I know that. Yeah. Because uh, it messed with GameCube controllers and Smash Brothers. People were all pissy. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so yeah, but I mean, it's covered under warranty. There you go. But you just have to pay for shipping, which is dumb. Yeah, it's that's very it's very bad. Um, I'm sure they'll be sued also, eventually. Yes. What's also interesting? It's interesting that the Dual Sense is having a drift problem because, I mean, in terms of like how the joystick is made, I'd imagine it's not that different from how, uh, the PS4 joysticks were i mean i'm sure they had like technologies and whatnot here and there but it should still be the same basic principle at least on the switch it's understandable it's a completely different setup you know the joysticks are are substantially smaller what there is so much dust on my controller (laughs) look at all that dust that's how long it's been since this thing so i guess that means you haven't experienced drift yet no (laughs) i did not use this console nearly as much as i should yeah so but but i mean look just looking at them they you can tell that they're pretty much the same as a dual shock 4 yeah right yeah yeah so there's got to be some sort of manufacturing bug in there i mean like that's causing this so these the joy con like thumbsticks are used in a lot of other devices also and I've never yeah. heard of drift happening in other devices. So that uses the similar thumbsticks, but I guess you don't use them as extensively. I don't know. So yeah. it's possible that there's other stuff going on in, inside of the, the dual sense. It's possible they could yeah. fix it in a future iteration. I mean, we got a, a very quick iteration of the DualShock 4, like a little bit after it came out because people didn't like the light bar and whatnot. Yeah. So we could get a new dual sense at any many minute now, really. Um yeah. I just think people like to you know see they like find, to find the problems. Find a problem, yeah. I mean, like I said, I don't know how far reaching this is. I mean it was enough to get an article made about it. And the fact that Nintendo had a very high profile problem with drift and it seems to be creeping into another video game company's brand new controller. A controller that is much more expensive has a lot of technology packed into it. 
Um, so I don't know. I know I know Microsoft when they showed the Xbox One controller, they bragged about how they tested the joysticks for up to like a thousand hours of playtime or whatever. And I assume they did the same thing with the, the Series X controller. Yeah, I, I think all companies do that. They they put it through yeah. stress tests and stuff. They have those machines that just jam on it for like a few days. Yeah. Has there been much talk about drift with the Switch Lite? Uh, I believe that it exists on the Switch Lite. Uh, yeah. I almost never hear about people. But I also don't think I know that many people with the Switch Lite, like who use it regularly. Yeah. Um. So anyway, keep an eye out for your PS5s to to start drifting. Yeah. All right, we got a couple of quickie stories here. Okay. Uh, first off, Six Days in Fallujah is finally coming out. I've never heard about this game before in my life until really like you never heard yesterday when I saw everybody going nuts about about it. Okay, so real quick, Six Days in Fallujah was a was supposed to be a 2009 release game oh um published by konami about the real life battle of fallujah that occurred during the second iraq war around that time you know the the actual news media got hold of it and did what they always do is freak out that a video game was going to depict a real life event um and so Konami canceled the game because it didn't want to deal with that shit. Um, cut to this year, and the game is back with a new developer and a new publisher. Um, and a lot of the original team that worked on the original Six Days in Fallujah and has revamped it and is now it's going to be released on current gen consoles um, this year. All right. This year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it the same game or are they completely remaking it? It's, I think it's the same. It, it they did remake it because it used to be a f- third person shooter. Now it's first person. Okay. Um, and then I think they, it's, it's still tactical, but it's not as tactical as the original concept was. Um, but it's still it's based on a real event. They worked with actual Marines who were there during the Battle of Fallujah. Um, to try and invoke a real, a, a more realistic sense of what it's like to be in active combat. Um, oh, it's coming out next year. Sorry. Okay, that makes a little, little more sense. Yeah. Because, like, you can't just take a 2009 game and just, <laughs> just put it out on no. the consoles. No, you no. Yeah, no. They, they've, like, changed it. They've updated it. Um, and so, yeah, it's and it's going to come out next year. So it says in an announcement, in its announcement, Victura includes a quote from former Marine Sergeant uh, Eddie Garcia, who was wounded during the Battle of Fallujah and proposed the original idea for Six Days in Fallujah in 2005. Sometimes the only way to understand what's true to experience is to experience reality for yourself. War is filled with uncertainty and tough choices that can't be understood by watching someone on a TV or movie screen make these choices for you. Video games can help all of us understand real world events in ways other media can't. That seems cool. Yeah, there's a very good idea here. And I think the trying to do this as a video game of uh, is very bold and like I, it can it can do a lot to I mean obviously you're never going to really know what a soldier goes through unless you're there with them but I think this will be this will hopefully be a nice alternative to the past 20 years of Call of Duty and Battlefield and the the Michael Bay style of military shooters that we've had um, I, mean, I I I need more tactical shooters in my life yeah. because I'm I you know, uh, we've had nothing but arcadey shooters recently. Even Ro- mm-hmm. uh, Rainbow Six, which was, which was my favorite tactical shooter, became an arcade shooter. Um, yeah. But I also love in video games when they make you do stuff that you that you think is morally wrong or like you don't yeah. want to do it, like in The Last of Us. Um, so yeah, he's right. There's certain things you could only do in the medium of video games that yeah so this this sounds really cool 
Now, now I only heard about this because uh, there were. I think the guy who's developing it said um, they didn't want to make a political game. Like it's not yes. a political <laughs> thing. They just want to show that the story really. Yeah. And like I understand that that that's commendable, but it's yeah. gonna be hard to not make a political not make it exactly <laughs> yeah especially because you're dealing with a real life military conflict from a very controversial war uh, that happened in pretty much everybody's lifetime that's going to be playing this game. Uh, so th- there's really no way you can't make this political, right? I think you know the closest you can do is focus strictly on the soldiers and not you know the politicians who actually like manipulate the war um but you're still gonna run into a political minefield part of the expression when you try to do something like this well that's part of the problem is that everything's got to have a political like everybody's got to have take a political side on something and and not everything needs to be like that like why can't we just see the, the the war for what it was why do we have to take take a why why do people have to make it a political thing is what i'm trying to say well i think i think in the case of this because it's based on a real world situation mm-hmm. the the inevitability of politics creeping into it is unavoidable yeah no like, no it, I, it, I i agree i just think it's something dumb like that that's the reality <laughs> well something like uh the division which you know takes place in washington dc and like Mm -hmm. you invade uh you know national monuments and stuff you know and and ubisoft like it's very clear there's a political message to it but ubisoft keeps saying like oh there's no political message to it invade the capitol building (laughs) so (laughs) so um that's the thing like there because there have been games that clearly are uh, have like a political message as you know whether it's intentional or unintentional but developers and publishers are so afraid to say that say that they do or they so they just say that they don't because you know they don't want to they don't want to offend anybody but you wind up offending somebody so yeah i mean it's a it it's a story you know you're trying to tell a story yeah. in a game and, and people could construe that as political all of the time even if it's yeah. not in if you're, if you're not trying to be political yeah um so this is what Neil Druckmann said on uh, on the fifth uh, February fifteenth. He said, "If your game deals with serious subject matter, then it is inherently political. If that's a problem, make a different game. Otherwise, you owe it to your your game to lean into it, doing your damnedest to treat it as to treat as honestly, completely as possible, warts and all." Which I think is a decent commentary on The Last of Us, because yeah. That was like turn. He, I guess, he knew it was going to be a political thing because because yeah. of what happened with the first game. Even though that wasn't, I don't think that was political at all. Um, but he saw how that was treated, so he was like, "Fuck it, we're leading into it this time." Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I don't necess- I don't subscribe to the notion that everything is political. Mm-hmm. You know, not every not everything has like a political bend to it. Um, I would be, you know, I don't know what the political angle you can get out of a game like, you know, Mario Kart. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Mario Kart is communism because (laughs) there you can't there is no unless you're like the tippity top of the top. You're all mixed in and anything goes, you know what I mean? Right. They spread the wealth. Same thing with Mario Party. Mario oh, Party, you were winning yeah. the whole time? Too bad. Too now, bad. Redistrib- now Billy yeah. over there gets gets all the stars. Yeah. But, you know, he, he has, you know, like I like I said, and like, you know, Druckmann's saying, you know, you're dealing with a very serious thing. You're dealing with a real world situation. Um so you're you're gonna run into politics. So rather than like try to dance around the subject, just admit that there's going to you know there, there's going to be some political talk in there and you may l- agree with it you may not but you know the important thing is that you're trying to just represent what the soldier went through uh i want to bring up uh the tweet neil Druckmann did today which was uh 
<laughs> he like took a screenshot of somebody i guess replying to that other tweet that i showed turns mm -hmm. out you can make serious games without any politics involved and i can't tell if this is a troll or not but it's far cry 3 hellblade says mm -hmm. sacrifice uh halo reach and spec ops the line <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know but Spec Ops is very similar to what it sounds like they're trying to do with the uh, five days in Fallujah. yeah Spec Ops the line every like that that's a game that like you know wasn't very popular back in the day but for fuck's sake people play Spec Ops the line it is such a good game um and yeah fucking all of those games are political maybe not reach but yeah, even still reach because the way it ends. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with things being political. It's it's always because you're either too afraid to confront something like that or you don't agree with the politics being discussed. I mean, I think that's the, the biggest reason people think The Last of Us 2 was political or that they would put a political like stamp on it is because the main character is gay. And it's like, why is that political? That's that just, that's not and the, political. Fact that, the fact that there's a trans character in there. Who? Is there a trans what's, character? Yes. What's their name? Uh, Abby. Uh, Abby's. Uh, the scar that Abby teams up with. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I forgot their name. I didn't know that was a trans person. Lev. Lev. I had no idea that was a trans person. Yeah. It's it comes up once and then it's like brushed aside because people uh people use uh the character's dead name. Oh. Uh, yeah, and that's that's how you figure it out. And then Lev is like, Did you hear what they call me? Abby's like, Yeah. You're gonna ask me about it? No. And then move on. See, po political to me is like uh we should tax the rich. <laughs> you know like like that that's what i think when people are like this game's got uh just talk about political stuff i don't know people can like say it shouldn't like, be political poli if the main character is gay or there's a trans character or something that shouldn't be people, political yeah people will say pl politics can be anything from uh disagreeing with the way a country handles a foreign policy to uh hey be nice to black people and then yeah. it's like, get your politics out of my head. <laughs> that, should, that should not be political at all. Yeah. Um, they do smoke weed in it, though, and weed's illegal in some places. Yes. Maybe that maybe that's political. Maybe that's the political yeah, part of what talking about. <laughs> um, uh. Anyway, uh, speaking of The Last of Us, look at that segue. Uh, we got oh, a TV we got show, a... and it's casted already. Why is yeah, this the picture that. they use? Uh Surprise, Pedro Pascal is going to be Joel in The Last of Us TV that show. That is a surprise. I think he looks like Joel, or he can look like Joel. A lot oh, yeah. of people are saying that they don't like this casting because he doesn't look like Joel. I think he could very easily look like Joel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Joel just has a beard. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I mean, if you slap a like a like a full beard on this man, he will look yeah, like here, he will look watch like Joel. Watch this. Watch this. Joel. Wow! Uh, wow, it's Ellie. Joel. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> I was, I, when this news posted, everybody was posting pictures of Hugh Jackman from Logan, mm. and it's like, just watch Logan then, because <laughs> it's the yeah. same plot. Yeah. People are not happy with the, uh, the that that the the girl doesn't look like Ellie. Bella Ramsey doesn't look like Ellie. I think okay. once again, she could easily look like Ellie. Yeah, I mean that's not hard. You just put her up in a ponytail and a red shirt. Also, most of these pictures are from like when she was much younger. So yeah, uh, I don't, I don't want to go by any of this. Yeah. Also, uh, both of these pictures are from when both of these actors were on Game of Thrones from the Polygon article. Oh, that's a yeah. Pedro Pascal was in Game of Thrones. Yeah, I did not know that. This yeah. this picture does not look like a Game of Thrones picture. I don't know what his character was on Game of Thrones. I didn't watch the show. Um, turns out I was right not to. A waste of time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was his. 
Uh, no, I, I, this, this looks like, this looks too bright. Yeah. Isn't Tom Holland playing Nathan Drake? Yes, but he's playing a young yes. Nathan Drake. Young Nathan Drake. Um, but no, I think this is good. I, I yeah. can't imagine, uh, I mean, Pedro Pascal is great. I think the cast is yeah. good. Uh, we've seen some great TV shows, uh, that were, uh, comic books and video games and whatnot yeah so it can be done but um i th yeah i think um because it's a tv show they'll be given the time to develop the story because like what the last of us is 20 hours so mm. a tv series usually runs for about that so they'll be given the time to actually develop and tell their story uh also too it's hbo and they put serious money behind everything they do so this isn't gonna look cheap by comparison uh yeah i just don't know how the last of us will translate to a visual only medium the the thing is because like there already exists a really good last of us adaptation and it's the road right and you know because if, if they put this show out then they run into the problem where people are going to say this is just the knockoff of the road uh so they really need to lean into what makes the last of us special which is that relationship between joel and ellie and their evolution through this world real quick cisco yeeted thanks for the six months i appreciate it uh but also real quick why are ps5 scalpers why are they want us to feel sorry for them oh uh, basically um they're just like, hey, we're providing a valuable service here. We, you know, we're offering people the chance to get a PS5 that they couldn't get in in the store. We're we're not doing anything different from what the big box stores do. They buy it at a price and then sell it at a higher price. We're basically doing the same thing. No, you're not. No, you're not. We're, you're we're, an we asshole. literally can't get them because of you. Yeah, you're. What essentially you're doing is you're robbing people of the chance to buy a ps5 legitimately and then you're selling it back to them not just at a higher price but at a significantly higher price often double retail price uh so is that so why do we need to feel sorry for them we don't they they said the the scalper in the article that is being quoted said you know we're not doing anything wrong there's a lot of bad press on this incredibly valuable industry, and I do not feel that it's justified. All we are acting as is a middleman for limited quantity items. Um, jo Jordan claims he secured 25 PlayStation 5 consoles in January alone and resold them for 700 euros each, around $950 American. That's a profit of 250 euros per PS5 as the console retails for $449.99. Um, and then the article says, "Remember, he's providing a valuable service here." Yeah, yeah. No, you're not. You, you you're using bots and other dubious means to buy up as many of these as you you can to then sell them back at a ridiculous profit. Unfortunately, Jordan's best, despite Jordan's best intentions, we think his plea for scalpers to get get more credit reputation will largely fall on deaf ears like jackals and hyenas scalpers tend to work in packs to secure multiple consoles using bots which are then shared around like an antelope's li lifeless carcass the speed and efficiency of bots make a normal consumer's chance of buying a console online almost impossible all right so basically he's just a piece of shit and yeah doesn't want people to think he's a piece of shit yeah um real quick metal gear solid the board game got dropped uh konami pulled yeah rights. that sucks um idw games was going to make it um but uh konami pulled the rights so idw dropped the whole game entirely um apparently the designer of the game still owns the rights to the design but he can so if you wanted to take it and bring it to another company he could but he cannot use the metal gear license yeah he, he got the rights reverted back to him but not the license yeah 
So the license is still with Konami, and he's got to yeah. get in contact with him to try to secure it. And Konami yeah. just does not give an F yeah. about their they video are. games right now. Yep. Um, this game was already up for pre-order. For a, a lot of people already pre-ordered it. Um, a version of this game was going to be available for both Tabletop Simulator and the Tablepedia platform. So you can play it virtually if you mm. wanted to. Um, a lot of people were looking forward to this. And Konami's just like, nah. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah, Sorry. Konami is a bad company. And lastly, Twitch creators on Twitch, Instagram, and TikTok will soon gain benefits from a major from SAG after. Yeah. Uh, wh- wh- why? I don't would understand. I want to pay into SAG after. Why? I mean, apparently, it's like thousands SAG-AFTRA, of dollars a year. Yeah, they do have like very good benefits. Like they have, like they do provide like insurance and health insurance. Uh, yeah. That might be worth a thousand dollars a year. I think they, I think they do. Yeah. Also, too, like if you're, you know, if you feel like you're not getting, if you're working too much, and like you're not being compensated for it, they can step in and like help mediate that. Does YouTube rep- people not count? Uh, f- previously, SAG AFTRA extended protections to some YouTubers' brand deals, but the new agreement will cover basically every platform: Twitch, Instagram, oh. TikTok, Facebook, and so on. Uh, in a statement, the uh, SAG president said the goal is to support both current and future SAG AFTRA members in this space for them to be able to access the benefits of union coverage. This rep- On the one hand, this represents a big step forward towards creators unionizing, which has been an unequivocally good thing, given the grueling work schedules platforms uh, subtly pressure them into, as well as the numerous agencies, firms, and groups looking to take advantage of them. Imagine the impact, say, a top streamer strike could have on Twitch, which has recently st- uh, seemed determined to make mystifying streamer unfriendly decisions despite vocal opposition. Oh, and healthcare. <laughs> on the other really hand, all I would want it for. On the other hand, in in some and around the influence of Spear have already expressed skepticism, noting among other, uh, among other things that SAG health support has not historically been great and the union also places limits on what production company members can work with, um, which could be especially problematic for content creators given that they operate in a very different space than Hollywood stars. So there are a hypothetical situation uh, in which, say, they want to collaborate with a particular YouTuber or streamer only to find out they're not union-affiliated, putting the kibosh on the whole agreement. And of course, union members have to pay dues, which may represent a higher barrier to entry than some creators are willing to pay. Wait, 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 wait. Is it doing that whole garbage where I have to, I I could only like like the, if I'm if I'm SAG, yeah. Does that mean I can't do the podcast with you? Probably. This is SAG. Why I hate. This is why I hate this shit. So this this is so this isn't just a SAG thing. It's every Hollywood. Uh, union, the uh, Screen Actors Guild, the Writers Guild of America, Directors Guild, Producers Guild, they all have uh, things in place with um, the major Hollywood studios where major Hollywood studios will only hire actors, directors, producers, whatever, that are part of the specific union groups. For the longest time, Robert Rodriguez uh, couldn't make movies with certain people because he quit both the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild. <laughs> So, um, a lot of that's why a lot of like early video games actors use pseudonyms because they weren't sure if it was covered by uh, their guild. Yeah, uh, same thing with anime. So I know that uh, I know that they're like allowed a certain amount of like people or work that is not union. Yeah, but uh, yeah, there, there's too many rules. I don't like rules. I, I I'm done. Yeah. I'm done being forced into rules. That's, I mean, that was one of the great things about YouTube and content creation in general is that there were no rules. You made yeah. up the rules as you yeah. went along. Like, is it worth it to go through all of these rules just to have health insurance? Like, I might want, I might just be willing to pay more for health insurance to just not have to deal with any rules. Well, you'd have to, I mean, you have to look into it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if they, if they, 
if the health if you do get good health insurance, that's one thing. But uh, if that it prevents you from doing the podcast with not only just me, but like you know, maybe you couldn't have Kevin back Literally on. Literally anyone back else, because yeah, because no one's gonna be in this. <laughs> yeah, that's so dumb. All right, I mean, I'll look into it, but I doubt I would ever want to do that. Yeah. All right. All right. Do you have a guess what time it is? Uh, I know what time it is. Quit of the week! Quit of the week! Quit of the week! That would be tweet of the week time, Will. I don't know if you could yeah, I was. That I, thought, I, I thought you were going to... I didn't hear you play it. Oh, it didn't come up for you? No, it did not come up for me. Oh, I had that muted for you. I'm so sorry. Well, now That's it's unmuted right. because this one's audio. All right. I don't oh, think boy. we'll get DMCA'd because this is a parody. But I kind of want to play the whole thing. It's a minute long. Uh, this is by Tom McGovern. It says, Jack and Diane, but all of the lyrics are sucking on a chili dog. Sucking on a chili dog. <laughs> sucking on a chili dog. 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 Sucking on a chili dog, sucking on a chili dog, chili dog. Sucking on a chili dog, sucking on a dog, sucking on a chili dog, chili. Sucking on a chili dog. You have to watch it when it gets to the break. Sucking on a chili dog, sucking on. On chili dog. That's enough. I just want the part where it goes to the little, little drum break. He yeah. pulls out his iPad and it has the lyrics on it and it's just sucking on a chili dog over and over again. <laughs> I'm sending that to my wife. It's very good. That's a very good yeah. one. Uh, And it'll be in your head forever now. Yep. Yeah. It's all right. I like John Mellencamp. Now... We'll talk to you people for a brief moment. Yes! If you left the comment on last week's Wolf Den Live, this is the part of the show where we will answer you. Of course, those are questions and comments left on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolf Den Podcast. But of course, ladies and gentlemen watching us at home, please start leaving your questions and comments here because we will get to them when we were done with everybody else. All right. Uh, from last week's Wolf Den Live, that's the one where we had Kevin Kenson on. I hope nobody left any yes. questions for Kevin because he's not here. Yes. Uh, Paul Stevens says, Kevin Kenson is a class act. Fun episode. Thank you. No problem, my guy. Thank him. Uh, the Thinker says, no timestamps. The... the Ridiculous. <laughs> no one is going to sit through two hours of this podcast. Luckily, you have free will. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and you don't need to listen to the whole two-hour podcast. Think about that, thinker. I um, I would love to have timestamps on the on the podcast, but it's just too, uh, I don't want to do it. And the, the 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 time frequently changes too because we cut out the middle sometimes, so it's a pain in the ass to put timestamps in. Mm. If any of you people would like to add the timestamps in the comments, I'll gladly put them in the description. But uh, otherwise, it's too much work. Don't want to do it. I've tried doing it where I have like a timer and I like stop the timer every time we start a new topic. Not worth it. Not worth it. Uh, Mike Bendik says, word of advice, don't bother with PlayStation 5 Xbox Series X uh, coverage yet. I've heard this take before. This is a weird take. <laughs> uh, I, as a lot of people, don't give a shit about them. Because uh, nobody is b able to buy one. Maybe next year, on the other hand, keep the Switch content going. That's a weird take, right? Yeah. I mean, it's hard. I mean, they're in the news. It, it's, it's, you know, what everybody's talking about. It's what is the industry is moving forward with. So we can't not talk about it. It's the new thing. Yeah, like not everybody has it, but it's it's yeah. the new thing, and people are interested yeah. in the new stuff. So that that's that. This is, sounds like a you problem. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Nick Province says, Evening, Bob. Your channel, specifically the podcast and Newswave, are my main go-tos for gaming news throughout the week. Any plans to have John on the podcast in the future? Keep up the great work. I haven't talked to him, but yes. Uh, I, I, I would... Uh, extend the invite to him uh, eventually i'm working i'm working my way around my my circle of people you know um anyway uh danny lewis i like this one a lot like a lot good i'm glad you do doofer says you're literally only hating on e3 for selfish reasons as a person who needs to cover it <laughs> You completely ignore the millions of fans who just love that there's one week in a year dedicated to having every company show us what they have in store. I'm not ignoring it. I literally said it last week. Nothing beats that excitement. And last year it was sorely missed. I literally said that that was one thing that was good about e having E3. Um, but it's the only thing. And I think that it's a detriment yeah. to the entire industry as a whole. I think it'd be better off just giving you the game to play yourself before, <laughs> instead of having it distilled through media. And I stand by that. And yes, I'm being selfish because it's my goddamn job. <laughs> yeah. I I'm feel like a lot of... Go to it. You don't gotta go to it. I feel like a lot of these people wouldn't be saying um, you're being selfish if they actually went to E3 mm -hmm. and experienced it the way we did. Because you think it's like all fun. You go to this big place where it's all the video games that are coming out this year and you get to see them and play them before everybody else. But it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> you only really get to see and play like four games. Yeah. The whole weekend. And in order so, to in order to do our job, yes, you only get to see like four games out of the yeah. hundreds that are there. I can't tell you how long I waited online to see, not play, see Marvel's Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> and then you went, eh, I don't know. Eh. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pain. I mean, it's cool. Like, listen, going to it once just to be like, I went to E3 is cool. But any, any more than that, doing any actual work there is a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, the reason why, like, you know, your IGNs and your game stops and whatnot can have like a lot of coverage is because a they employ a lot of people and b they you know have they actually get to go a week before e3 to judges week and like see and play all the games ahead of time so that they can write their articles and release them you know when they get announced at e3 proper yeah and uh they get special appointments and stuff that nobody else gets uh, yeah. we got a couple, but, um, and we're very fortunate for that, but yeah. it's not like the big time people get. So like we, we have to fight for those spots. Like Will had to wait online for four hours to go see yeah. the Avengers. I had to wait online for three hours to play Mario Odyssey for 15 minutes. You think freaking uh, uh, what, 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 freaking what's his name? Brian Altano. You think he had to wait three hours to go play Mario nope. Odyssey? It's a pain in the ass. Uh, PAX? Awesome. But also, I feel like I'm treated better at PAX. Like, I got a lot of appointments. I got to play a million games. Get to hang out with a lot of people because it's an actual open conference. Yeah. So you can be, like, in the pit with everybody who's also playing the games and stuff. Love PAX. I'd uh, be more than happy to never go to an E3 again and just keep going to PAX. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we're in the chat now. How you doing, guys? Yes. Hey, everybody. Uh, Di Colazzo with 11 months. Did I say this already? Ha hey, y'all. Happy 11 months. Love y'all. And Kali... Kalila... Kalil Jama with five months. <laughs> Hi. Love the podcast. I love you, too. Um... Connor in the chat says, any videos on the way for Bob's personal channel? Actually, yes. I filmed a, a video of me drinking the coffee Coke. I just don't know when it'll be up or when I'll edit it or anything. I was going to say, I didn't see that. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I filmed it. I didn't post it or anything. Yeah. Thoughts on how WandaVision is going, Will? Uh, I love this show. I think it is great. Um, my wife, I know my wife and a lot of other people have said that they didn't really get it until episode four which i understand um but i think it might actually be the 
most unique thing the MCU has ever done while still being accessible to people who are only used to Marvel's style of superhero films. Um, so yeah, if you have Disney Plus, check it out. I, it's really worth it. It's re- it's really good. I can't wait to see where where it goes because I have no idea where they're going to take this. I genuinely don't. And it's nice. <laughs> I just got an ominous DM that just says, the land of make-believe is a great place. <laughs> That's all it says. Well, I mean, they're not wrong. I'm, I'm a little scared. Uh, will the Snyder Cut is coming soon? Is it? I thought it was last weekend. No. So this is what they're doing. Uh, they released teasers all week last week for the trailer that debuted on Sunday. The movie itself is not coming until like March something or other. And I'm going to see it like an asshole. I haven't seen the original Justice League, so I will be, I'm excited to watch this as if it's a new movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is basically. Basically. (laughs) Yeah. But I, I get, I have the privilege of not knowing what the original was like. Right. Good, which I'm so envious of you. <laughs> uh, hashtag free Jerry. Why? What happened? Oh God. Um, Chris PX. Okay, now let's talk about something that really matters. What toys did you end up getting from Burger King Kids Meal? What were you not here? Um, oh, I threw them. Hold on. <laughs> you know, I, I meant to. I meant to order the Super Mario Brothers meal the other day, but I didn't. Because you can't order it on Uber Eats. You have to order it from Burger King's website directly. So I ordered it from Uber Eats. Really? Yeah, I got two kids meals. Oh, I might, oh, I'm talking, it might have been Grubhub. I'm talking about the Super Mario Brothers meal specifically. Uh, well, you don't get a toy yeah. with that meal. No. Which is no, useless the... then. Yeah. I want my toy. So I yeah. got two kids meals because I'm fat. Uh, one of them, I got the Splatoon toy. Which I was a little upset about because I don't care. <laughs> then I got in my second meal, I got do you never believe this? Another Splatoon toy. <laughs> I I said if I said if it's another Splatoon toy, I'm ending the stream. And then it was another Splatoon toy and I just ended the stream. <laughs> um uh. Yeah, I wanted a McDonald's, but I couldn't get a McDonald's. It's weird. like wasn't a I don't even know what toys McDonald has. McDonald's they has. have Pokemon cards. Oh, that's right. And nobody can get them because scalpers are going in and buying Pokemon cards. Do you know if there's a girl's toy at Burger King right now? Because it, sa- it asks if you want to have a boy's toy or a girl's toy. And I was going to pick boys for one and girls for the other. But I was like, because then maybe I would get two different toys. See, I thought that they were doing away with that. They should be because Nintendo is genderless. Right. No, but I mean, like, in general, like, all fast food chains are, like, doing away with boys' toys and girls' toys. Right. So. Then what happens if they get, like, a sponsorship with Barbie? Then just everybody gets a Barbie? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, whatever. <laughs> well, I mean, they they would probably get a sponsorship with Mattel. Ah, uh, and, and then it would just be everything. To, yeah, it'd be, like, Fine. Uh, Barbie, Hot Wheels, Masters of the Universe, things like that. Max Steel. Yeah. Um, you can only buy you can buy only the toy for two dollars each at Burger King. Yeah, but then I have to go there. And that's the problem. Yeah. I don't want to go anywhere. American kids meals are normal meals to the rest of the world. Is that true? I don't think that's true. Actually, yeah, no, it is. So a kid's meal, I learned this from a documentary on food that I regret have watched to have watched. Uh Kids meals, the amount of calories in a kid's meal is the amount of calories that an adult should intake during a meal. And the amount of calories of a, like what, you know, the extra value meals or whatnot uh, are the amount of calories that a family should intake. Holy shit. During a meal. Yeah. 
that's just careless by whoever packed those meals together. What if you were feeding two kids who got the same toy? I know, then we would beat the crap out of each other. It, it's happened. That's what I figured. Like, if I'm getting two meals, come on, it's two kids. Yeah. It's also possible that all of the toys were gone and this is all they had. So. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Uh. Anything else? Oh, here we go. Uh. Edward says, so according to IGN, Ryan Johnson has uh, reportedly confirmed that the Star Wars trilogy is still in the works. That his Star Wars trilogy is still in the works, though there are still, still no, no set timelines uh, for the projects. P.S. Do you ever plan to have Arlo on your podcast? I don't know him. <laughs> so no. Unless I get to know him. Uh, I, I, yes, I, I, I'm reaching out to the people that I directly know and speak to, you know, first before I start reaching out to other people to get try to get on. Yeah. Uh, I I did see that Ryan Johnson's Star Wars trilogy is still in the works, um, but he has been busy. He's making a Knives Out follow up right now. So they have not told him when he needs to start working on his Star Wars movies yet, but I will be excited to see that. Did you know? <laughs> that of all the Star Wars movies uh-huh. uh, of, of the Disney era, The Last Jedi was the only one that did not feature any significant behind-the-scenes issues or shakeups. And people wonder why he got an entire trilogy to himself. I mean, like working with him. It's also the one people didn't like, Will. Yeah, well, those people are dumb. <laughs> I'm dumb? <laughs> <laughs> um, could you mention the tools available to get the consoles before scalpers uh, you have this uh, this is all I got for you uh, now in stock.net I have it for a graphics card that I've had for I've had this page <laughs> it's in when I open up Chrome this comes up for a month I've had this and I haven't been able to get it so if you have if anybody in the chat has an AMD RX 5700 specifically a 5700 let me know um, I will I will buy it from you. But anyway, now in stock.com or Zoolert. No, I'm sorry, now in stock.net, Zoolert.com. You can go down to Xbox Series X, PlayStation 5, uh, and leave the alert on, and it'll tell you it'll start, it'll do this. Okay, shut up. It'll do that when it becomes in stock at any of these stores. So uh, do that. You just have to leave it up. But there's also text message alerts, but it's easier to just leave it on your computer. Um, yo, Pablo Hidalgo is a bitch. A rude bitch to fans. Who is that? He, uh, I forgot his exact job title, but he's like uh, a pretty big deal at Lucasfilm. Um, he was like mean to a fan <laughs> once. So, I mean, I mean, he doesn't make the movies. So, get off his case. Well, everybody, thanks for hanging out, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern right here on twitch.tv slash Wolf Den. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put an archive version of it up over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolfden Podcast. So you can go over there and watch it on demand whenever you want. And if you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, you can do that as well. We're also an audio podcast on anchor.fm slash Wolfden Podcast and your preferred podcast service of choice. And that includes iTunes, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, and now apparently, because I made sure of it, uh, Amazon Prime. Oh, we are on that. Yeah. So whatever you listen to a podcast on, we are there. But no matter where you listen to us or watch us, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us, uh, like us and whatnot, because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. Guys, thanks for being here. I'll be on tomorrow for the um, for the Nintendo Direct. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Wolfden. Uh, I'll hopefully try to put it up either on the podcast channel, the clips channel, or both uh, afterwards. So, um, if you want some Nintendo Direct reactions, go there. Sorry we couldn't uh, cover it for the show, 
but that's yeah, just the but, way uh, the news goes. Yeah, tweet your congressman. Tell him to make Nintendo Directs <laughs> on Tuesdays. I think today we will raid Scootish. So yeah. everybody go over to Scoot's stream. Say ha say sus because he's playing Among Us. Um, and then I'll see you all. Oh, and Thursday, me, Dan, and AJ are going to be playing uh, Mario 3D World on this Twitch channel. So I'll see you then too. And thanks for being here. And goodbye, everybody. Bye.